good morning and welcome to Montgomery Evangelical Free Church. We're excited to be worshiping with you this morning from your homes. Uh, and we are excited to be taking part in what God is doing in our lives, in our community, and across the world. My name is Kevin Oslins and I have the joy of serving as our youth and outreach pastor. Uh, and I have the joy of bringing a few announcements in our church life to your attention. First of all, you'll notice that you won't see Pastor Brian this morning. Uh, he is recovering well from a surgery this past week. He is doing well, uh, and we appreciate your continued prayers for him, uh, but we are grateful to have Pastor Joel bringing the message this morning as well. Today's hike for our college and career group has been postponed to a later date, uh, so please, uh, if you would like any more information on that, please email Pastor Joel at jristucha at mefc.org. Due to the overwhelming heat that's forecasted for today, uh, we felt it was wiser to allow you to stay at home. Uh, we do also, of course, have our in-person services each week at 9.30 a.m., and we would love for you to join us for that if you're comfortable doing so. Face masks are required, as is registration, so you can visit mefc.org slash outdoor to register for next week's service at 9.30 a.m. on Sunday, June 26, July 26th. Uh, and this coming Wednesday, our youth group is excited to be hosting a giant pizza party for our rising seventh graders, as well as all seventh through 12th graders. But to welcome our new seventh graders coming up this year, we wanna throw you a party and have fun. Uh, so please, you can register for that at mefc.org slash students. That's mefc.org slash students. If you're in seventh through 12th grade, it's seven to 8.30 p.m. We'll be providing a giant pizza as well as games and a whole lot of fun for you. And we're excited about what God wants to do in our ministry and in and through your lives. Let's continue and prepare our hearts for worship with a word of prayer. Father, we come before you now. We are humbled to know that you love us, that you care for us. And in the midst of the craziness of this world, all of the distractions that we might have going on in our minds, Father, we pray that those will fall away so that we can worship you truly. Father, help us to not be distracted by the little things that frankly, don't deserve our attention, Father. And God, we pray that you will quiet our hearts. Help us to sing the words that are on this screen, on our TVs at home or on our phones or wherever we're, we're, we're worshiping you from. God, help us to sing these as a prayer to an amazing God, to the creator of the universe who cares so deeply for us. Father, we pray that you will be present in each one of our lives for those who might not know what it means to have a relationship with the creator of the universe. Father, I pray that you will speak to them this morning. Help them to know who you are, to know that you care for them, and to know that you desire a relationship with them. And Father, for those who have gotten bogged down, uh, whether it's financial troubles or health troubles or anything else uh, in this season of the COVID-19 virus, Father, I pray that they will find peace in you, that they will find healing in you. And Father, most importantly, I pray that they will find love in you. For everybody under the sound of my voice right now, I pray that we will know that you are love, that you care for us so deeply. You know every little thing about us, and yet you love us the same. Father, speak to our hearts this morning as we worship you and hear from your word. We pray these things in the holy and amazing name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Jesus said, If you love me, keep my commands. And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate to help you and be with you forever, the Spirit of truth. The world cannot accept him because it neither sees him nor knows him. But you know him, for he lives with you and will be in you. I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. Before long, the world will not see me anymore, but you will see me. Because I live, you also will live. Join with us in worshiping our great Savior.
have just sung of the mercy and greatness of our God. When we begin to understand a God like this, our hearts are drawn to know more and more. How do we get to know someone, to really know them? There's only one way to do that, and it's to spend considerable time in their presence, learning those special, unique things about them that make them really worth knowing. Jesus wants us to know him and deepen our relationship with him. The Apostle Paul reflects on his relationship with Christ in his writings to the Philippians. But whatever was to my profit, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. What is more, I consider everything a loss compared to the surpassing greatness of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord.
Good morning. My name is Ted Catramatis. I'm one of the elders here at MEFC, and, and we're so thankful that you're able to join us online this morning as we worship our Lord. I will be reading our scripture passages for today, which are Mark chapter 3, verses 31 through 35, and also Luke chapter 14, verses 26 and 27. But before we read scripture together, please join me in a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we praise you for who you are, for what you've done for us, most of all for sending your Son, Jesus Christ, to die on the cross for us that we might have eternal life. Lord, we especially praise you in this time of pandemic and know that you are in control in spite of the fact that so much around us seems to be spiraling out of control or seems to not necessarily be getting better. But we know that, that you are there, Lord, and that you've always been there and that you always will continue to be there in charge of everything that happens, and we thank you for this. Lord, we know that we have fallen short of your standard. We pray that we would all look within ourselves and see where we have fallen short, that we would confess our sins before you, and that we would appropriate the power of your Holy Spirit, Lord, that we might repent of these sins and draw closer to you as time goes by. And Lord, we pray for any that might be watching or listening this morning that have not yet made a decision to trust you as Lord and Savior. We pray that they would be moved by what they hear this morning, worship in song, worship in reading your word, worship through preaching, and just pray that your Holy Spirit would convict them of a need to know you as Lord and Savior, and just pray that more numbers would be added to your kingdom. And pray, Lord, that we would take advantage of opportunities in our midst, especially during this time when many are questioning what exactly is going on and why things are happening. Pray, Lord, that we would, as you tell us, always have a reason for the faith that we have and, and a reason for why we believe, and pray that we would be able to express that clearly and to share our faith with others. We pray that you would give us opportunities within our uh, community here in the greater Montgomery area that we would be salt and light to those around us and that we would love our neighbors and show them tangibly what it means to be a follower of Christ. Lord, we, we thank you for all our blessings. You have blessed us richly, Lord. We thank you for the fact that we live in a nation where we're able to worship you freely. And we thank you for the fact that not only do we have the technology to worship you online, but that we're back to worshiping you in person uh, outdoors. And just pray that as time goes by, that you would heal our world of this pandemic and that we would be able to get back to more normal services. Lord, we, we thank you for our material blessings, for the the food we have to eat, the clothes we have to wear, the shelter that we have. But Lord, we, we know also that there are needs uh, within our congregation. We pray, Lord, for continued healing for Pastor Brian. We thank you for his successful surgery this week and just pray that you would uh, continue to be with him. We pray likewise for Bruce Berard. Thank you for his uh, successful surgery and pray that you would continue to heal him as well. We pray for Philippe Souza's family in Brazil suffering from the effects of COVID and just pray, Lord, that you would bring healing to them and strength and comfort and peace as they go through this trial. Lord, we know that there are many others in our midst who have troubles, either physical troubles or financial troubles as a result of everything that's been going on and just, Lord, you know who they are. We uh, lift them up to you and pray that you would bring healing, that you would bring peace, and that you would be a very real presence to them as they go through these trials. 
Lord, we pray for our fellow believers in other countries that do not have the freedom to worship you. We pray that you would give them boldness, that you would give them strength, that you would give them protection as they often venture into harm's way just to worship you. And finally, Lord, at this time, we pray that you would be with Pastor Joel as he brings forth your word, as we finish up the sermon series on smashing idols, and Joel talks about the idol of family. Lord, we pray that you would anoint him and that you would uh, allow him to bring forth from your word what it is that you want us to know this morning. And it's in your heavenly name that we pray all these things. Amen. Today's scripture reading, starting with Mark chapter 3, verses 31 through 35. And his mother and his brothers came, and standing outside, they sent to him and called him. And a crowd was sitting around him, and they said to him, Your mother and your brothers are outside seeking you. And he answered them, Who are my mother and my brothers? And looking about at those who sat around him, he said, Here are my mother and my brothers. For whoever does the will of God, he is my brother and sister and mother. And then moving to Luke chapter 14, verses 26 and 27. If anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters, yes, and even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. Whoever does not bear his own cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. And may God bless the reading of his word. Well, good morning. My name is Joel. I'm one of the pastors here at MEFC, and I have the privilege of closing out our last sermon in the series, Smashing Idols. And if you've been with us through this series, you know that we've been looking at the good things in our lives that can so easily replace God as the most important thing in our lives. Today, we're going to be examining the idol of family. In the 2000 film, The Family Man, Nicolas Cage plays a successful but arrogant businessman named Jack Campbell. Uh, Jack Campbell is self-absorbed. He's greedy. And his path to this uh, began 13 years before the start of the movie when he deserted his girlfriend, Kate, in an effort to better his career. Jack now lives a carefully, carefree uh, bachelor life filled with fancy cars, penthouses, and loose women. However, through a series of events, Jack is given a glimpse of what his life could have looked like if instead of pursuing wealth and success, he had married Kate, settled down, and had a family. And so over the course of the movie, uh, Jack realizes that true happiness is not found in money and achievement and sexual escapades. No, true happiness can only be found in becoming a family man. Now the reason I bring this movie up is I think it illustrates a sentiment that is very common in our current culture. The sentiment that nothing is more important than family. According to Pastor Kevin DeYoung, quote, one of the most acceptable idolatries among evangelical Christians is the idolatry of the family. I believe DeYoung is correct. Because you see, if idolatry is defined as taking a gift from God and making that gift more fundamental to our meaning and purpose and identity and fulfillment and happiness 
than God is, I would argue you would be hard-pressed to find anything in the 21st century United States that more accurately fits this definition of idolatry than family. You see, when it comes to idolatry, often the greatest gifts from God have the greatest potential to become idols. And we would all agree that family is a tremendous gift from God. A tremendous gift. And yet we must be vigilant to make sure that family does not become an idol. And so that's why we're closing out this series by talking about the idol of family. My outline for this morning is as follows. I want to talk about the promises that make family an idol, the realities that drive us back to God, the transformative power of God's family, and I want to close with a self-diagnostic, you might be idolizing family if. So first, let's talk about the promises that make family an idol. What promises are these? Well, throughout this series, we've repeatedly seen uh, that the most prevalent idols in our lives uh, are also those that make us the biggest promises. And family is no exception here. Here are six promises, and I'm sure I could give more, but here are six that family makes. The first promise is that family promises to be an ever-present help. An ever-present help. You know, our, our lives... Uh, are are often full of circumstances that we cannot face alone. Circumstances uh, where we need the help of other people. Family promises to always be there in our time of need. Second promise is a sense of security. A sense of security Uh, in those moments when your life is chaos. Knowing your family is in your corner, supporting you, encouraging you, Knowing that gives you great security even when life feels insecure. Third, unconditional love. That no matter what mistakes you make, no matter how lovable, or I guess I should say unlovable, you might feel, the love of family never fails. Fourth promise, constant companionship. That in family you will always find friends uh, who will share your experiences with you. Who will live life with you. The ups and the downs, the good and the bad, the blessings and the struggles alike. Promise five, transcendent purpose. Transcendent purpose. You know, I was watching uh, an interview with a Cirque de Soleil acrobat the other day. And he was describing how fulfilling it was for him to perform with Cirque du Soleil. Uh, It was literally a dream come true. Nothing, he said, nothing gave him a more strong sense of significance and purpose than being a performer for Cirque du Soleil. Nothing, that is, until he became a father. That is when he realized his true purpose. If you have a family, that is when you will know the reason for your existence, the purpose for your life, the promise of transcendent purpose. And then sixth, the promise of a lasting legacy, that through your children and through their children, etc., that you will influence those who come after you, that your influence will live beyond your lifetime. So help. Security, love, companionship, purpose, legacy. In family, you find the convergence of these six promises. That brings us to the second point. The realities that drive us back to God. Because you see, uh, while depending primarily on family to fulfill these six promises is tempting... It is very tempting to do so. Two realities, I believe, push us back to depending on God when it comes to these promises instead. Two realities. First, the reality that family cannot fulfill 
Family cannot fulfill these promises in an enduring manner. Now, uh, I'm not saying that you won't find help and security and love and companionship and purpose and legacy in your family. That's not what I'm saying. But if you are primarily dependent on your family for those things, you are in a very precarious situation. And you're in that situation for two reasons. First, you're in, in that situation because families are sinful. In families, you find things like conflict and anger and bitterness and even betrayal and desertion and, God forbid, divorce. And while many of us can think of the numerous ways that our families have blessed us, Many of us can also think of deep hurt that has been inflicted on us by our families. Sin makes it impossible for families to fulfill the promises that we just mentioned as reliably as you might hope. I'm not saying they can't do that for a time or for a season. But if you want those promises to be fulfilled in an enduring fashion... You can't look to family for that because families are sinful. Uh, second reason, though, second reason that if you depend on family for these promises, you're in a precarious situation, is that family members die. Yes, they're sinful, and secondly, uh, they die. Listen, death is part of this world. And sadly, you can't count on your family members to always be present in this life. In 1873... Horatio Spafford was a prominent lawyer in Chicago. Uh, he, is, he was married to his wife, Anna, and he had four daughters. And uh, in 1873, the family had planned to take a vacation to Europe. Uh, but at the last minute, Spafford was delayed, so he sent his wife and his daughters on ahead of him. But tragically... While they were crossing the Atlantic Ocean, the ship they were on sunk, and all four of Spafford's daughters drowned. Only his wife survived. Now, upon hearing the news that his daughters had drowned, Spafford, who was a Christian, penned these words, and they're probably familiar words to many of you. He, he penned this, When peace, like a river, attendeth my way, when sorrows like sea billows roll, whatever my lot, thou hast taught me to say, it is well, it is well with my soul. Now here's the question, how could Spafford write these words immediately after such a tragic loss? How could he do that? And the only answer I have is this. Yes, his family mattered to him. But his family was not his idol. His family was not his everything. Spafford loved his daughters. He loved them. But he also knew that only in God could the deepest desires of his heart be satisfied. And so that is why in the face of losing these dear children... In the face of that tragedy, knowing that God was still with him, he could say, it is well with my soul. Family cannot fulfill these promises in an enduring manner. So don't expect family to do that. But there's a second reality. There's a second reality that I think pushes us to depend on God when it comes to these promises rather than family. And it is this, that God gave you the desires for help and security and love and companionship and purpose and legacy. He gave them to you so that you may find satisfaction in him first. He's the one who's supposed to satisfy them. God alone can meet the deepest desires of your heart. God alone can perfectly fulfill those six promises. You say, well, Joel, how does he do that? Well, he certainly does that in part through family, to be sure. 
But he also does that through the work of his spirit in your heart. Through, through your relationship with him, one-on-one, -on -one, just you and God. He does so uh, through the fellowship you have with your church family. We'll talk about that in a few minutes. He does that through the spiritual children that you might produce by making disciples of all nations. I could go on. But the broader point I want to make is this. You do not need a genetic family for God to meet the longings of your heart. And I would go so far as to say that when you think you need a genetic family to meet these longings, when you think that family is the only means by which God can satisfy those longings, frankly, that is insulting to God. As if he's dependent on something else to bring you fulfillment, to bring you companionship and love and purpose and legacy and all those things we talked about. God is not dependent on anything to do that. So in, instead of doubting God, we need to run to God as the only one who can meet our hearts where they are with himself. Listen, do you want ever-present help? Do you want that? Psalm 46.1 says, God is our refuge and strength, an ever-present help in trouble. Do you yearn for a sense of security? Listen to the psalmist, Psalm 40. He says, I waited patiently for the Lord. He inclined to me and heard my cry. He drew me up from the pit of destruction, out of the miry bog, and set my feet upon a rock, making my steps secure. God is where you find security. Are you searching for unconditional love? Romans 5.8 says that God shows his love for us in that while we, while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. That, that is the definition of unconditional love. While you were sinners, I died for you. Do you seek companionship? God promises, I will never leave you, nor forsake you. Do you hope to find your purpose and leave a lasting legacy? Deuteronomy 4 says, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. And these words that I command you today shall be on your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children and shall talk about them when you sit in your house and when you walk by the way and when you lie down and when you rise. Loving God. Passing that love down to the next generation. That is our purpose. And that is how you secure a lasting legacy. So God was, he is, and he always will be the ultimate source of help and security and love and companionship and purpose and legacy. But that's not all God has to teach us about family. As we come to the third main point, the transformative power of God's family. And this is when we finally get to the passage that Ted read a few moments ago. You were probably wondering if I was ever going to get there. Here we are. Let me read it again. Mark 3, starting in verse 31. And Jesus' mother and his brothers came. And standing outside, they sent to him and called him. And a crowd was sitting around him. And they said to him, Your mother and your brothers are outside seeking you. And he answered them, Who are my mother and my brothers? And looking about... At those who sat around him, he said, Here are my mother and my brothers. For whoever does the will of God, he is my mother, brother, and sister, and mother. And then looking ahead, Luke 14, 26, the words of Jesus. If anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters, yes, even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. Whoever does not bear his own cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. 
Now, in these verses, Jesus is redefining our understanding of genetic family. And he's doing so by offering us membership into a greater family, into his spiritual family. Put another way, when we become part of God's spiritual family, it transforms how we understand family in three critical ways. Three critical ways. Number one, it transforms how we understand family identity. Family identity. You know, our our family names uh, often teach us about our family identity, in particular, our last names. So take me, for example. Uh, My last name is Restuccia, technically pronounced Restuccia. It's an Italian name. It's actually, to be more precise, a Sicilian name. Uh, My great-grandfather, Giovanni Restuccia, immigrated to Ellis Island in 1910. Uh, But the, the name Restuccia also has a very specific meaning. In Old Italian, the name Restuccia means, I'm not joking, it means he who is boring. He who is boring. You see, I have a proud family legacy to live up to. So if you're falling asleep during this sermon, all I have to say is, you have affirmed me. Thank you. Living up to my name. Jesus offers us a new family identity here. You see this in verse 33, uh, starting in verse 33. It says, And he, Jesus, answered them, Who are my mother and my brothers? And looking about at those who sat around him, he said, Here are my mother and my brothers, for whoever does the will of God, he is my brother and sister and mother. You see, Jesus' spiritual family was more fundamental to his identity than his genetic family. Those who served God, those who obeyed God just like Jesus did, they were, in Jesus' mind, family members at a level much deeper than biology. And so here's my question. Is this true of you? Is your membership in God's family more central to your understanding of yourself, who you are, your identity, than any other family allegiance? Now, maybe you say, no, it's not. Or maybe you say, well, I'm not sure, Joel. Either way, I would encourage you, press into the family of God. Maybe that means joining an MEFC small group. Maybe it means serving in the church somehow. Maybe it means uh, cultivating deeper friendships with other believers. Certainly, if you are not yet a believer, if you are not yet a child of God, would today be the day that you join God's family through faith in Jesus Christ? That's always the first step. But my broader point is this. If you are a follower of Jesus today, your spiritual family is is your most important family identity. It was for Jesus, and it is for you. So, Jesus transforms how we understand family identity. Secondly, uh, Jesus transforms how we understand family membership. Family membership. Verse 34, again, and looking about, At those who were seated around him, he said, Here are my mother and my brothers, for whoever does the will of God, he is my brother and sister and mother. So Jesus is telling us that membership to his family is open and available to all who come to God in faith and obedience. Uh, It doesn't matter what your ethnic background is. It doesn't matter what your uh, skin color is, your socioeconomic status. It does not matter Through trusting Jesus, through surrendering your life to his lordship, you become God's child. You become a member of God's family. 
And just practically speaking, when you do so, your family becomes a lot bigger. Listen, I, I have one biological brother. One biological brother. But as part of God's family, I have millions of spiritual brothers and sisters. You know, many of you know uh, Numa Cole, who attends MEFC. Numa and her two children have been staying at our house uh, for the last several months. And, you know, when I mention this to people, uh, hey, Numa's staying at our house, at, at times I'll hear the following response. Uh, Why would you let somebody who isn't part of your family stay at your house? Why would you do that? And my answer is pretty simple. Numa is part of my family. Jesus says so. But here's the question for us. Are we willing to treat fellow believers like family? Are we willing to do that? I'd encourage you to reflect on that question. Honestly. And assess how effectively you're living that out. Being members of God's spiritual family transforms our understanding of family membership. So it transforms how we understand family identity, transforms how we understand family membership, and then finally, it transforms how we understand family priority. I'm in Luke now, verse 26 of chapter 14. If anyone comes to me, And does not hate his own father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters. Yes, even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. Whoever does not bear his own cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. Now Jesus is using some strong language here. That's clear. Uh, He talks about hating his own father and mother and wife and children, etc. What's that all about? What's this hating language? Well, uh, the expression to love someone and hate someone else, uh, that was a first century Jewish way of saying to love someone more than someone else. So you could reword this verse, if anyone comes to me and does not love me more than his own father and mother and wife, etc., etc. You see, following Jesus requires counting all things lost compared to to him. Even things we value deeply. And it doesn't, doesn't take away the value of those things. That just means that Jesus has greater value than those things. And so this, this reordering of priorities, this reordering of priorities is what Jesus is calling for in this text. And, and this can be hard. This can be difficult. I mean, that's why Jesus describes it in verse 27 as bearing a cross. This is difficult stuff. What it means is this, practically speaking, if allegiance to your genetic family draws you away from God and his family, that's a problem. So, for example, if allegiance to your uh, genetic family means that you violate God's law, Jesus is telling us here we must side with God's law. If allegiance to your uh, genetic family means rejecting uh, the career path that God has called you to, then you must follow God and go down that career path. If allegiance to your genetic family means not reconciling with or forgiving a fellow brother or sister in Christ, a member of God's family, just like you, you need to follow God and be reconciled. You need to follow God And forgive. The point is this, this, friends. Uh, When we become part of God's family, we must, we must prioritize obeying God over any genetic family obligation. We must prioritize obeying God over any genetic family obligation. Now, thankfully, obeying God and honoring one's genetic family are rarely at odds. They can be, but in my experience, they're usually not. So, 
Praise God for that. But, but if and when they are at odds, and it will happen, friends, God's family must take priority. New identity, new family membership, new family priority. Listen, God has given us our genetic families as a tremendous, tremendous gift. But as I said at the beginning, those things that are a tremendous gift also can become tremendous idols in our life. Our genetic family was never meant to replace God or to replace our spiritual family. When this happens, they become idolatrous. Now, as we come to the end here, I want to give you a self-diagnostic. Just something for you to think about as you go forth this week. You might be idolizing family if... Here are some statements to think about. You might be idolizing family if... You believe that marriage and kids are necessary for finding meaning, purpose, fulfillment, and even spiritual maturity. You might be idolizing family if uh, you have a deep and unshakable fear of disaster for your family. You might be idolizing family if you feel an unhealthy level of exasperation or, or letdown when your family fails to meet your expectations. You might be idolizing family if you are more interested in bragging about your children and being a parent than in bragging about Jesus and being his child. You might be idolizing family if you prioritize your family over things God has called you to do. For example, you go missing from church for entire seasons because of your children's extracurricular activity schedule. Or use the we are having family time excuse as a common excuse for not doing things with your church family. You might be idolizing family if you would never dare invite someone from your church over for Thanksgiving or Christmas because, quote, holidays are for family. And finally, you might be idolizing family if you would abandon what God's word says to defend and justify the sinful actions of one of your family members. Now, I know that's that's a lot to think about. I just threw a lot at you. Some of you maybe are now offended with me. I'm actually okay with that. Because I believe that the Spirit needs to work on us, myself included, through questions like this. But if you're sitting here and you you believe that, that family might be might be a struggle for you. It might be an idol for you. I'd encourage you, come talk to me about it. Come talk to Pastor Brian, Pastor Kevin. Come talk to someone about it. Listen, we are on the same team. We want to help you center your life on Christ. Not to the exclusion of family, but in order to keep your family in its proper God-ordained place. That is our goal. In Luke chapter 20, uh, Jesus makes this statement. He says, The sons of this age marry and are given in marriage, but those who are considered worthy to attain to that age and to the resurrection from the dead neither marry nor are given in marriage. Now, there's a lot being said here, but let me paraphrase at least one point Jesus is making, and it is this. Your genetic family as much of a blessing as it may be, your genetic family is a temporary gift for this life. Don't let obsession with your genetic family keep you from loving God first, and don't let it keep you from pressing into your eternal spiritual family that Jesus purchased with his own blood. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we confess that we have too often replaced you with gifts that you have created and given to us. And one of those gifts is family. Forgive us for our idolatry. 
Lord, not only are you able to fulfill the promises that family cannot, but you also offer us membership into your eternal spiritual family by grace through faith. What an amazing offer that is, Lord, for anyone here, anyone listening to this who has not yet become part of your family, would this be the day that they turn, accept Jesus' death on the cross for their sin, and receive the right to be called children of God? What a tremendous blessing that Christ has made those who are once enemies, namely us, his friends. That he has made those who are once far off your sons and daughters. Thank you that we can be part of your family. In your name we pray these things. Amen. Amen. Go in peace, and may the peace of God go with you. Amen and... Amen.